Radio Split Ranch. Hello and welcome once again to Radio Split Ranch, a monthly visit with the Capital Region's great broadcasters of the past and sometimes present. I'm Warren Garling when I'm not on the radio. And if you're a regular listener to our monthly conversation, you realize I open each podcast the same way, saying the broadcasters we interview are great. But I'd be a little presumptuous making that statement this month as the tables are being turned, turntable pun intended, and this month, I'm the victim. You'll hear how this all came about in a moment as the very qualified former broadcast journalist Diane Donato joins me at the Radio Split Ranch for a conversation about more than just my stops at about 10 radio stations and a TV station in my 50-plus years, full and part-time in broadcasting. Hope you enjoy it. Well, Diane Donato had the gall to say at the end of my interview with her a few months ago, why don't we turn the tables and have you talk about yourself and your career? And I said, nah. I mean, if you listen to enough of these things, my, my life is there, you know. And if you buy my memoir, you know, I'll have to ask my mom, which is still available through uh, Amazon.com or the Audible version on, on Audible. Y- you got the, the Warren Garling or Chris Warren story. But there are some things that I guess— I haven't talked about, and that's a lot of what happened after I left full-time radio. Right. And I really thought, after sitting here in this chair and being Mm -hmm. interviewed by you, Mm -hmm. I thought, Chris is so generous. And and he's, you know, elevating the broadcasting industry with these interviews. Well, thank you. But that we should turn it around and ask some probing questions. Oh, okay. Well, Well, you're leading into some things. I see you did some show prep, so I'm now- Yes, show prep's on my list here, too, by the way. Now I'm nervous. (laughs) Yes, you should be nervous, of course. Very, very nervous. But you did at first. You said, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. There's been enough of that, but no, I thought we should- And then at the lunch, a few weeks afterwards, a couple other guys asked me, you know, when I mentioned, well, Diane's here, and then, you know, I interviewed her a couple months ago. Oh, yeah, we listened. We loved it. When are you going to be, you know, to tell your story? And and two of them said it to me, and I said, really? So here it is, boring or not. So we're going to, no, 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 not going to be boring. (laughs) It's it's going to be good. And as you mentioned, I've been thinking about it as I did my show prep, is you do interject a little bit of your own history in these Hmm. interviews, of course. Sure. And we get to hear your air checks, which are amazing, (laughs) by the way. They are amazing. Well, thank you. (laughs) And I think you also mentioned on um, one of your recent podcasts that these are now going into the archives at the Schenectady, at MySci. Yeah, MySci in Schenectady in the museum. Yeah, well, they've got such a history there of the WGY and WGFM and also WRGB, you know, the local broadcasting. Yeah. Yeah. Really, a lot of it started right here, thanks to GE. Yeah. So they, when I contacted them, they said, yeah, we'd absolutely like to have this in our archives. If anybody wants to research you know, radio, they'll be able to do that with, you know, and hear from the horse's mouth. Right. Yeah. And that's in the back of my mind a little bit as I put together some questions to ask, because I think there are a lot of things we can talk about. Some things, yes, maybe they've already been covered or covered in your book, Mm -hmm. right? But maybe we'll bring up some of them as well. But some of them, I think, from an archival point of view, because we're all in the business, there are a lot of these things that we know and we take for granted. But maybe I'll even ask you a couple of those Hmm. questions that somebody at some future date who isn't as familiar with the business Hmm. might get a little look at, too. uh, That's a good way to go. Yeah, I like that. So well, thank thank you for some putting thought into this because I don't do any of that prior to my interviews. <laughs> I can tell from your air checks that you are somebody who knows how to do show prep. Well, so, I, I know that there true, was some in there. There, you, there. Yeah, there was. Yeah. It's casual, and yeah. and we've all done W I N G at radio, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> we've all been forced to. Yep, yep. Which actually, that's another p- thing I should put on the question: is the dream we've all had that dream? But that'll be oh later. yeah, yes, okay. absolutely. I'll, if there's time, I'll I'll ask you about that. Okay, okay. All right. So you have talked a little bit about your career, but give us just a little bit. We know you started when you were very young. Yeah. Yeah. Basement radio guy. Right? Exactly. Saw my first radio station when I was 11. And I've always thanked Harry Haynes for that. Harry was a an Air Force recruiter out of Newburgh, New York. And we lived in the same trailer park with Harry. He was stationed there you know, since he was an Air Force guy. He was just stationed there and moved a lot with his family. And so he was there as a recruiter. And he had a 15-minute 
very prepared show on the local radio station in Beacon, WBNR. And he just said to my mom and dad one day, you think Warren would enjoy, I was 11 years old, would you, and he enjoy maybe seeing what a radio station looks like? And I'd never really thought about it before. I was listening to radio by this time and, you know, uh, the the Beatles were just about to hit. So I'm, I was, you know, a fan. And so we went. I had a horrible toothache that day, and I very I, I don't really remember a lot about the day, but he invited me again a few weeks later when I was feeling better, and it was that second trip that probably cemented it for me. And I said, hey, I, I love the way this looks, and, and it's amazing how it sounds, and it's coming from a room that's no bigger than the one we're sitting in here right now, my den, you know? And how, how does that happen? And, and so it really, it hooked me immediately. And the light bulb went off, yeah. your eyes lit up, and, yeah. and then you were doing it. And so then you started... From what I understand, you started doing it in your own basement a little bit, and a friend yeah. of yours also did it in his basement. Yeah, we and, and I don't know where the idea came from to do it. I don't know if I heard from somebody else that they, you know, did such a thing. I really didn't know anybody in radio, obviously, when I was 11, 12 years old. But when we moved into our first house, we had a, a, a finished basement where part of it was our bedroom, my brother and I, and and it was uh, there was this beautiful built-in desk. And I said, boy, I could I could build a radio station right here. You know, I could build a little studio. And so I did. And, and really just out of materials that I had, or I went to Lafayette Electronics and bought little switches. I was going to ask, and, where does a kid and, get material to do yeah. that? Well, mom and dad had gotten me when they realized my interest in, in radio and electronics. So they had gotten me a little kit that I could put together where I could make my own radio to listen to, but also build one to broadcast. Well, really in broadcast, it probably went about, you know, 10 feet, but there, there was little diodes and things and you stuff. So that kind of got me started. And I took that and built from there. And then they eventually, probably for my 14th birthday or Christmas, I think, bought me a little quarter watt transmitter that went all the way to the kitchen upstairs. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's really as far as it went. I think one night I can, uh, my neighbor was uh, in on me with all this kind of crazy stuff. And I hooked up the transmitter to the rooftop antenna that we had for the TV that we weren't using at the moment. And I actually got to his house, which was probably about a, a hundred yards, you know, over a little rise where we lived wow. in Glenville on Drums Road. Yeah. So, and, and he actually did, did hear me, but for only for a few moments and then, you know, who knows, I probably blew a tube or something, but yeah. So it was, I was never really into the electronic part of it. I didn't want to be an engineer. It was just a way to talk to more than one person to entertain them. Yeah. And I just thought that'd be so cool. And your parents were, it doesn't sound like they were showbiz parents, but they took you around to some things. They were, they supported you a little bit. You Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you did get a job before going off to college. Right? I, I did. Yeah. Actually, after, uh, uh, you know, a couple of years in the basement doing that, I made a uh, an audition tape right there in my little setup and was able to go to school and uh, use their language lab recording, you know, tape recording devices to make copies, sent it out to a bunch of radio stations. I'm 16 years old and nobody responded. And of course I didn't know you know, how to do follow-up phone calls or anything. I just expected they're going to discover me and I'm going to be on the radio. You know, didn't, didn't really work out that way, but I, I had been in junior high in ninth grade. The guidance counselor said the, the local station in Schenectady, WSNY has an intern program where kids your age can go. In fact, I think you had to be at least in ninth grade to go and can spend a couple of hours a week hanging around the radio station and doing jobs for them and, and learning the business from the inside, which I thought was just so cool. And so I started doing that. And even after they, the, the school year ended, I kept going all summer after my ninth grade year until the format changed on the radio station and went to top 40. And all of a sudden, they couldn't be bothered with kids anymore. Okay, Before that, it was like a middle-of-the-road type you know, music station. So I got my introduction that way and met some of these disc jockeys that I kept in touch with. 
So when I was you know, looking for, for work and not getting it for, through these tapes, all of a sudden, out of the blue, I get a call from the nighttime uh, disc jockey there. His name was Roger Anthony Del Nero Jr., according to the license hanging on the wall. He went by the name of Tom Jefferson on the station. WSNY at the time were the Young Americans, and so we all had Young American names. We had uh, Walt Fritz was Paul Revere. Doc Perryman was George Washington. Let's see who else did we have. Tom Jefferson, I mentioned, was Roger. And there were a few others. Chet Arthur, Chester Arthur, believe it or not, was a newsman and eventually a disc jockey for a time. He was my age and helped me edit my memoir, by the way, before he passed a few years ago. His name was Phil Blanchard. Anyway, I get this phone call while I'm babysitting my cousins on a on the the last day of my uh, junior year, okay, this is, adorable. this is this is crazy. Last day of my junior year, it's a Thursday afternoon, early evening, and I'm babysitting my my cousins lived a couple miles from our house, and the phone rings and it's Tom Jefferson, it's Roger Del Nero, and I, I said, how did you find me? Well, I called your mother to find out where you are. And he said, would you like to work on the radio this weekend? And, and, and I, you know, after they picked me up off the floor, I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I was supposed to find somebody to work and I couldn't find a friend of mine to do it. And I forgot. And, and I, I have to go to a wedding and blah, blah, blah. He said, you'd need to work from midnight to six Friday night. And again, midnight to seven on Sunday. And, and he said, you know, do you want to do it? And the first words out of my mouth were, well, I'll have to ask my mom, which is what I called my, my memoir, because I didn't drive yet. I, I hadn't even taken driver ed yet in high school. So, And again, crazy to think of a, a kid doing a midnight to 6 a.m. shift. It, it's, I don't exactly. know if that's legal at this point. Well, you know what? Then. I pro- I, I must have had some working papers. I think yeah. before you're 17 or so, you have to sign working papers. At least you used to have to. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, and he, of course, when I said, I'll have to ask my mom, he said, well, I talked to her already. And she said, she'll get you there and, you know, pick you up and all that stuff. I can just picture you in that room oh. with the phone, putting uh. the phone down on the receiver being a kid and just doing a little dance. Uh, you know, right? uh, maybe, maybe. Bolt of lightning. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like. It, it just came out of nowhere, you know. It's the prime example of uh, what I learned uh, from another friend years later who said it all the time. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Okay, now I had practiced a lot, so I kind of knew what I knew and thought I could, I knew I could do it, and evidently Tom knew I could do it as well. Yeah. I'm not sure if he listened to the tape that I sent to his boss or anything. I, I really don't know why. I'm, I must have been last on his list. That's all I can think of. Yeah. He ran out of other people to ask, yeah. So I don't know if this jumps too far ahead to your college days, but I'm also thinking now you've already got some technical experience. Mm-hmm. In your own basement. <laughs> True. And then you also have the experience of now starting to work with some professionals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Plus, I'm sure you were starting to then be a little bit more of an astute listener. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, listen. sure, sure. I, well, I had done that for years. Uh, I got to listen to people like Cousin Brucey when I lived down in Walden, New York. You know, some of some of the greatest jocks of all time, you'd hear the New York Signal right. know, that far. Yeah. And if you want to be a great writer, read the great writers, There you too, go. Right? That's and, true. And so you were getting all of this by osmosis. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how long it was before you went to college then, but... What was left for you to learn? Well, that's an interesting interesting question because I kind of felt the same way. I mean, for some reason, it was always assumed that I would go on to college, even though nobody in my family had ever done that. Mom and dad weren't college educated, and dad worked as a car salesman supporting a family of eight, you know, six kids and mom and and he. And so they had to work hard to even come down, you know, come up with some of the money. I had to get, I, I did get a, a scholarship from my high school for some of the money, and then the rest I borrowed and paid off. Gosh, I was still paying it off when I got to my second, or as I call her, my last wife. <laughs> so it was quite a few years where I was still paying off the uh, student loans, as still happens today. But yeah, I... I actually, at my high school graduation party, my Uncle Charlie was there. He was the sage of the family. He was, at that point, uh, about 70 years old. And I'm talking to him at my graduation party after the, you know, the, that weekend. And I just said, uh, I don't know why I'm going off to college because I, I, I'm in the business. I know the business. I can do the business. 
And he said, do it for your folks. Do it for your family because you know, they, they're expecting you know, big things of you. So you know, get that college education. And so I you know, figured, yeah, he's lived longer than I have you know, by many years. Let's, let's go with Uncle Charlie's idea there. So for Uncle Charlie and mom and dad, I, I went off to Graham Junior College in Boston, which is probably one of the few schools that would have me. I, did, I was not a great student. I hated taking tests. And and you could tell by my grades. I mean, I I passed all my all, all my regents classes, but had terrible time with the regents exams. Interesting. And yeah, yeah, a, a biology I took twice and and failed the regents both times. So I had to take health in my senior year just to you know get out of get out of high school. So I was never a terrific student, which is perfect for radio, I think you'll find. <laughs> you, know, you, you just have to be observant. You don't have to be, you know, terribly well-educated, I don't think. <laughs> it, it's interesting that you say that because as I listen to a lot of the podcasts you've done, people are obviously very intelligent in this business. They are. They really they are. are. But when you talk to them about how much education they had, you'll you'll be yeah, you know, maybe not surprised to learn a lot of them didn't go to college. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and did just fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure though you did get a good experience out of college. I think there was a college mm. radio station. Mm -hmm. You were then closer to the Boston market, I think. I was in Boston, yep. I was in yeah. Kenmore Square in Boston. I became a lifelong uh, Red Sox fan by living that close to Fenway Park after being a Yankees fan because my dad was, you know, so he wasn't happy, but, you know, I enjoyed that. But, uh, yeah, I would not have traded the college experience for anything, even though it really only lasted one of the two years. I was going to a junior college, and I did not go back for my second year. But the friends I made, still friends today, we've had some reunions over the years and still keep in touch with a lot of them. Worked for uh, at least one of them, now that I think about it, uh, later in my career, which we can get to when we get there. But Boston in the early 1970s was uh, just the place to be. Oh, it's a Friday night date night. And I love starting, starting the show off on the right foot. But I'm crawling. On the wrong hand, every year more than 5,000 cars are stolen, almost half because the keys were left in the car. Steve and Paul, don't leave the keys in the car. Don't be caught helping a crime. Don't advertise in the side of the car. Keys in car. If you're lucky enough to have a car here at school, Steve, make double sure that you lock it and pocket the key. I'm advertising that Steve's going to have a car here at school. The uh, Community Involvement Office of Graham Junior College announces that there are opportunities for freshmen who want to get involved in community work over the summer. Contact, contact, yes, do that to Mark Nadoff at extension 360 or drop by the Community Involvement Office in Levitt Hall. To publicize an announcement of a club or organization on WCSB, call 267-1042 or extension 230 or leave the announcement in the mailroom of Kenmore Hall at least one week before the planned activity. Get it all. It's cheap. For the most part, it was just uh, eye-opening to me to live in such a huge spot compared to where I grew up, you know, I mean, to be in a major city like Boston, it was, it was just, it was the, I was there for almost two full years and enjoyed it every moment of it, besides being homesick the first few weeks, maybe, you know. Right, right. <laughs> Another part of your show, generally on the podcast, is you talk about how many call letters each guest <laughs> right. has, right? right? Exactly, yeah. So how many call letters do you have? About 10, Okay. Maybe 11. I, I just listened back to one of my podcasts I had to quickly create in order to stay on my schedule because one of the interviews I had done had gone wayward. And, and so I had to do one about a little more about me. This is really going to be the second Chris Warren. I may just name this one Warren Garling. In that, the end of that show that I did, I added up my 10 and I said I wasn't including WMHT-FM because I was never a regular voice on there, but I did really work for the station, the AM or you know, the FM and the TV. And so it, it's 10 or 11. And I won't be adding them up at the end of this one since I did the since last you're, one. Since they've already Yeah, yeah we've already done that. Count. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, but, and that's average. I, if you, if you listen, oh, I would think. yeah, most of us have worked at at least, you know, some, the average is 10. I've had some as few as five or six. And I've had some like John Gabriel as, and, John, and Don Bowers as many as 16 and 17. So it, it kind of averages out. So I'll do a little swerve now, since okay. we've established that some of the 
the different stations itself, some of the chrony, some of the chronological aspect of that's already mm-hmm. come up, right? Yeah, yeah. So we'll swerve a little bit now, and we'll start talking a little bit about generalities. Okay. The business. Mm. So, and you, and just to mention too, though, as a recap, as far as formats, you've done country, you've done top forty, you've done news. Mm-hmm. You just mentioned some public radio. Yep, exactly. So, so I, I've been exposed to classical, but you wouldn't want to hear any of my pronunciations. So some of these <laughs> might, you know, might be something that'll trigger a memory having to do with one format versus the other, but a lot of them I think are universal across the board. So hmm. let's talk a little bit about a day in the life of you going in to do a shift. Hmm. Uh, you can talk a little bit about research maybe yeah. and or yeah. just like how you prepared for for an air shift. Well, you know, to be very honest, in the earlier days of my career when it was live, I did not do a lot of show prep. It was it was really seat of your pants stuff, but be t- while the records were playing, and they were records at the time, or maybe tape cartridges, or the, the music was on while they're playing, I'm I am reading. I am reading either the local newspaper, the weekly newspaper. I'm reading, you know, magazines, mostly music or radio oriented. But you know, that's where I would come up with you know some of the trivial things that I would say, you know, between records. But for the most part, I really didn't spend a lot of time in again early in my career now. You get to the early 2000s when all of a sudden, and and I was no longer full-time, I I went part-time after a 17-year full-time career. Then when you're doing voice tracking, where you're recording your whole six-hour show, which takes maybe about an hour to put your portion into the computer. Now, when you're doing break after break after break, and you don't have the two or three minutes while a record is playing to think about what you're going to say, you have to be prepared or you just, you're going to get boring. You're going to start saying the same thing over and over again. Oldies 98.3 with the Stones. On this date in rock and roll history, 1964, the Rolling Stones appear on the BBC's Jukebox Jury as panelists. Their impolite behavior, including referring to Elvis's latest single as dated, causes a furor in the British press. So what else is there? Oldies 98.3 continue in 60s and 70s. It's like many groups, uh, a bunch of guys that started out as background singers and studio musicians. Hamilton, Joe Frank, and Reynolds broke out with Don't Pull Your Love. Here come the shy lights on Oldies 98.3. Oh, girl. So I spent a lot of time in my part-time career, again, once we started doing, you know, voice voice tracking, as we call it. So in the early 2000s, when that became the norm, I did a, I, I would I would probably spend an hour just doing the, the show prep for the six-hour shift I would record. And then do all the recording afterwards. Exactly. Do, have do all your notes. And, exactly. Knowing almost by the, uh, by the, by the break, what I was going to say or what I was going to do. Now, the format at the time, I, I did 18 years part-time at WTRY from 2002 to uh, 2020. And the format was uh, oldies. And so what I would spend some time doing as well, my good friend John Gabriel, who uh, worked at the station as well and was the quote unquote music director, although he didn't have a lot of say because it was done nationally by the, the, the owners as to what kind of music we would play, he would have the wherewithal to send me in advance the log of the four hours, five hours, or six hours of music that I'd be playing. So I knew where my breaks were, and so I would start looking up information about these songs and these artists. And so I wound up with probably about a two-inch thick book of intros and trivia about all these oldies. You know, we're, we're talking, what, almost 50 years of, of oldies. You know, we'd play everything from the late 50s to the early 60s, right on through the 80s. So, okay, maybe 30 years, if you will, 30, 40 years of top 40 music. And I would I would note when I would use that information, so I wouldn't use it again for many, many weeks, maybe months before I'd share that again with somebody, but I pre- prepped for it. So you had a, a thick notebook, handwritten, mm-hmm. with... Actually, it's typewritten. Typewritten, yeah, okay. Yeah, I did it on the computer. So, yeah. but, so you had that, and that's yeah. amazing. That's yeah, really amazing. Yeah. And of course, you went from a time, 
and your career spans so many years that materials, background materials in the beginning were whatever magazines and if if maybe the station subscribed to a couple of things, mm-hmm. you might have had Rolling Stone. You That's might have it. Had, but, and then eventually show prep did become easier, right? Well, boy, when, well, again, by the early 2000s, we're talking the internet. And so I was able to find a whole mess of stuff. Yeah. And, and I'm an avid reader. You can probably tell over here, I don't know how many you can see, but a lot of books on the Beatles yeah. and other artists that I've kept over the years that I've uh, enjoyed. I was able, when well, I'm going to play a Beatles song, is able to go to you know one of these books and pull out a story about it that perhaps I'd never heard before, and hopefully the audience hadn't heard before. So that made it fun. The very sad part of all that, not that it matters much now, but I was very hurt at the time, is I came into work one weekend, and they had cleaned up the studios at iHeart in, uh, in Albany and Latham, and my book got tossed. Oh. With, the, with all that you know, trivia information, all that research I had done that took me many, many years to do. And we looked for it for a couple of hours, you know, just to see if it hadn't gone yet to the dumpster and never did, uh, never did find it again. So, <laughs> and the, the crazy thing is you would think I would have, you know, kept a digital copy, you know, somewhere on the computer. If I did, it was on an older computer, and I wasn't doing it at the time that I lost the book. So the it was all lost, but, you know. Yeah, that's a painful one. That, yeah. that really was. That really was. But I also learned that maybe I shouldn't be leaning so much on that stuff. Maybe I should be doing you know, more local content, which is another thing that's gone by the wayside, unfortunately, the way radio's gone. But I always believed in not only entertaining the audience, but informing them and educating them as well. So I would talk a lot about what's going on, you know, in the area, you know, at the moments that I was on the radio or what's going on, you know, tomorrow. Make sure you plan ahead to, to, you know, go to the fair and stuff like that. 98.3 WTRY. Well, I've never been to Spain, but that hasn't stopped me from not learning Spanish. Something like that. How are you this morning? I'm Chris Warren. Also heard the Beatles, KC and the Sunshine Band, Carol King in that set. We got another bunch in a row starting with the contours in just a couple of moments. Looks like a lot of fun for the whole family at the Empire State Plaza later today. The Hannaford Kids Expo featuring Jigsaw Jones, the case of the class clown, plus music by Uncle Brothers. Okay. Uh, Reptile adventures and a lot more. Fun starts at 10 o'clock this morning. Empire State Plaza Convention Center in Albany. Bring the family and enjoy. You just mentioned the word entertaining, too. And when I listen to your air checks, you are a very entertaining guy. Well, thank you. And I, I'm thinking, wow, how do, you, how do you do that all the time, be like that? And I, I think a lot of it is your personality. Were there also services, too, that at least you were able to well, you know, borrow from occasionally? <laughs> in, Even the This Day in History uh, lists yes, that were yeah. occasionally Th- that's available. That's true. Now, that's interesting. A couple of those, I used to do that all the time on TRY when the first time around. I, I worked for uh, the station I grew up listening to, and I, I couldn't believe my luck in being able to work for WTRY back when it was still 980 AM. And I worked there from 88 to 92, just Saturday morning, six to 10. That was it. And then the occasional in-person gathering, if we were doing some promotion or something, I would get the, this day in history and see if there's anything, you know, funny that I could make out of it. And I had to come up with a punchline, you know, uh, about, you know, the first commercial airline flight, you know, and say something at the end, like, and the luggage arrived just last week, you know, and stuff There's, like that. Yeah, you just, yeah, sure. that stuff. A lot of it was just some, you know, off the cuff, you know, while I was live. But some of it, you know, I, I talked, researched, you know, quickly and said, okay, I can say this about that. And if I could get some patter going between the newsman and I, I would do that a lot. 98 WTRY doing the monkey time with Major Lance. And the kinks are here because they're so tired of waiting for you. They're going to sing the song anyway. Lou Tinney has news next. Meteorologist Bob Kovacic on WTRY. Humidity is 62%. The winds out of the north of nine currently is bright, sunny, and six degrees. This is Lou Tinney for Newswatch 98, a service of WTRY for the Capital District. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad somebody finds this temperature funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Spring is on its way, oh, though. Hey, not too far down the road, right? Three, five months in there somewhere. <laughs> Picking it off with the king at seven minutes after eight o'clock in the Dale House Rock. I grew up in the era of laughing. 
Okay, we're talking the late '60s, early '70s. Laugh-in was a, a a punchline every every ten seconds. It was, and they were called blackouts. Okay, where you you do a real quick thing and you black out and you go to the next thing. And so most of what I did was to try to hit the punchline as I would hit the jingle to go into the next song, or you know, again hit the uh, you know, intro to to some song. And so, you know, that's, that's what I based it on is don't, don't give them a chance to think about it or don't give anybody a chance to laugh. Just go right into the next thing. And it seemed to work. It was just my pattern. Well, your sense of humor seems like it's a pretty kind sense of humor, too, and a fun sense of humor. Yeah. yeah, Did you ever get in any trouble? Did you ever get a hotline call about your humor or anything else where you were in trouble? You know, I've I've been pretty lucky in that I I don't believe I worked at any radio station that had a hotline into the studio by the program director. I myself— learned not to interrupt the talent when they were doing their show. I learned that from my first boss, Don DeRosa, at WSNY in 1969. He would wait until after the show to yell at me. <laughs> you know, but but so I was learning. It, it was a learning process. But he did not jump into the studio and say, what did you just say that for? There's only one time I remember him doing it, and I mentioned this in my memoir. He's in Central Park in Schenectady on a Sunday afternoon, And I'm on the radio. I'm probably 17 uh, at the time. And I'm on the radio having a ball as usual. For When I went back to high school at the end of the summer of 69, I could only work on the weekends. So I had a six-hour shift on Sunday afternoons. So he's out there. He's in Central Park. And he's sitting next to a bunch of kids that have their transistor tuned in to our radio station. So he's smiling. He's going, all right, we're making some points here. I finished playing something by, I don't know, maybe Petula Clark or Dionne Warwick, and I go right from that beautiful song into, and I remember the specific song it was. It was called Hot Smoke and Sassafras by a group called Bubble Puppy. The song probably never got into the top 30, okay? But we played it for a while, probably, again, the summer of 69 or 70. And uh, and I'm just unaware that I have just caused that group of kids to turn the station because it, I, it was a jolt. It went from this, you know, nice lilting beat to this heavy guitar thing. And I didn't I didn't blend. OK, it didn't blend at all. And it shocked the listener to the point where he changed the station to one of our competitors. Well. He did call me up that afternoon before I was done. I, you know, thank God he didn't come in. He probably would have knocked me flat, <laughs> you know, but he explained to me what I had just done and don't do that again. And again, I'm still learning, you know, right. and, and, and he was great about that. So, so I do owe Don the fact that I never, even as a program director, had a hotline. I, I you know, I just felt that you got to let them make the mistake and then tell them later that they could do it better. Yeah. That story about a bad segue is a good segue into talking about segues. And in the beginning, mm. you were creating your own music yes. list, right? Yeah. You, yeah. Weren't, you weren't walking into a clock. A, a computerized or a, list. Yeah. Or, I mean, which again started happening by music directors. Yes. There was still oh. was a human involved in absolutely it, yeah. you've been through that whole evolution yeah yeah i mean when i first started certainly there was a playlist all right there was if you were a top 40 station you had the top 40 songs and some oldies that you would throw in now and again for spice and you had certain categories you had to play at certain times of the hour a lot of this you know the program directors took some time to research they knew that if their competitor was doing the news at this time during the hour and they were not then they should play a certain song that would keep the listener there or or at least attract them immediately so when WPTR for say they had their news at 55 after the hour okay we at SNY had it at the top of the hour, I think, most of the time, and I think TRY did as well. So you would counter-program to that. So if the kid turned the station because he wasn't going to listen to the news, there better be a song on there that you recognized, that you that you liked. So it wasn't going to be a brand new song. It was going to be maybe a top 10 song that people were very familiar with. And hopefully you'd keep them from that into you know the, the newer stuff as you went through the hour. So that really was research that program directors and music directors did. So we did follow a clock, but you had a choice within those categories as to 
how to segue the music. There was some help occasionally by using jingles, okay? Jingles are the pre-recorded call letters or logo the station used, uh, slogan the station used, you know, done by singers. And, uh, you know, most people know what a jingle is, but they weren't just there for information. They were there to help you do the segue. So you'd have a cart that you'd play between two songs that would say slow to fast, And so the jingle would start out kind of slow and then pick up the tempo and go to fast so you could play a fast song after that. Or again, it would say slow to medium or it would say fast to medium. And and if you played the right jingle, if you weren't talking, you could make that segue, you know, very nicely and not shock people and send them to another station. And when you're you're mentioning the clock, which I think would be posted in the studio somewhere, yeah, what it was right, right in where, front of you, where your stop, where your spot breaks are going mm-hmm, to be. Mm-hmm. Out of your ten different call letters or so, how many times were the music artists all on index cards in different categories? Mm, you, did you have that mm, system, um, or what other system for filling in the music? Yeah, we had when I programmed WGNA, and and obviously before I programmed it, we I, I think the uh, previous program director did it as well. Our oldies were all on three by five index cards, so, you know, all the title, the artist, how long it was, what year it's from, and and maybe a, a note or two about the song or the record itself. It might say, you know, you play this from album number twenty five. Don't accidentally play cut number three, it's got a swear word in it or whatever, you know. And so those things would be on the card. But as far as the uh, current stuff, really it was as simple as if, say, the A category, which would be your your biggest selling songs of that moment, that would be the top 10 or 15, maybe even the top 20, you chose from as close to the front of the pile as you could and put it in the back when you were done. And that's how the rotation happened, so you wouldn't play the same song. Now, at, SN, or at a, a GNA, where I worked for many years, and many of those as program director, we had all the top 40, top 45, actually. We called it the 45 caliber survey because we were a country western station when we started. <laughs> We'd have those all on cartridge. They were all on cart. So what you did is you, if the cart was faced, you know, the label was up, it meant that it was available to play. When you were done playing it, playing it, you put it upside down in the rack, and that way you wouldn't play that song again until most of them were upside down. Then you turn them all back upside right and go from there again. So that that's how the rotation worked in something like that. That's and, how the humans and, used to do it before the before computers. Before computers, exactly. But once the computers came in, obviously, we that could all be done you could tell it you you could tell the computer you don't play these two songs back to back or you don't repeat an artist in the same three hours or whatever it might be and you could you know to get the computer to do it for you but back in the you know the 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 day and and occasionally you'd get in trouble for certain things like and i tell this story i tell this story in my uh, memoir because and it's it's one of my favorites again Don DeRosa the nicest program director that, that a guy could learn from you know when I was about the age that I was but he let me know at the end of one show when I had played a brand new song by Sly and the Family Stone called Hot Fun in the Summertime one of my favorite all time oldies you know now and uh, it was brand new and I played it the first time and I fell in love with it I said oh this is going to be a smash this is going to be number one and which it did become. And so what I did was I was only supposed to play from that category. Uh, there were four songs in the category, and I had a four-hour shift. So you're only supposed to play one song, you know, each hour and not repeat in the four hours. Well, in the fourth hour, I just loved that song so much, I moved it up, and he caught it. He knew I had done it. He had heard it in the 3 o'clock hour, and I was playing it again in the 6 o'clock hour. And he waited till I was done. And when I went out of the studio, he called my name down the hall. And I went in there. He said, you like that that song by Sly and the Family Stone? I said, oh, yeah, that's a smash hit. It's going to be a big. He said, if you ever play it twice again from that category in your show, you're out of here. I mean, he was he was adamant. You know, yeah. he, he said, you know, I mean, he had a station to run, you know, and records to sell. Yes. You know? and, and there was that serious side of it. Yeah, too. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a yeah. good story, though. Yeah. Uh, along those lines. When you talking about the serious part of it, mm. the Arbitron ratings, mm. uh, how deeply did you get into scrutinizing those? Did you ever do any of the 
I knew somebody who actually went to Arbitron and looked through the diaries, the diaries once yeah. just to, to see the handwritten comments from the listeners. How involved did you ever get in that in your career? Never that deeply involved, never went to look at the diaries, but certainly it's it was smart to do because, well, here's an example. When I was programming WGNA, and I had been, I was there when they signed on in 73. I was their news director eventually. And then in 1975, I went away for about 11 months and came back and became just a disc jockey. I was no longer doing news. I came back as a jock. And within a couple of years, I became program director. So we're probably talking 1978, I became program director of the station. Anyway, I had talked to somebody about why we're having trouble breaking through ratings-wise. There, there were a few reasons why it took a while. First of all, we were the first, GNA was the first FM country station in the market, okay? This is in the early 70s. I mean, even cars, you had to get a special, you had to order FM radio special, okay? You couldn't get AM, FM as standard equipment in some cars in the early 70s. So first of all, we didn't have a lot of people listening mobily because they couldn't listen in the car. Secondly, we're at the very top of the FM dial, 107.7. So nobody's dialing past you. Now, a dial, for those <laughs> that are too young to remember, is how you went up and down the, the, the radio selections. You didn't push a button. You didn't type in you know, 101.5. You actually dialed up and down, up and down the, the radio, the stereo or you know, your transistor, whatever. And so people weren't finding us by accident. And we weren't advertising right away. The boss was kind of smart. My, my boss there, uh, John Lindstra, he said, I don't want to advertise until we feel we've got the format down, that we're doing what we want to do, that we really hope people will not only listen to us, but come back to us. Okay. So he said, let's, let's wait a while. So for the first year or so, you had to find us by mistake or see us at a remote broadcast, which we did quite a few of. So the bottom line is I'm, I'm programming the station in the late 70s. And somebody said, you know, when people think WG, they think WGY. Okay, WGY. I mean, they've been on the air for, at that point, it was, you know, 50 years. And so, you know, if they're writing in their diary what they're listening to and they start writing WG, there's a chance they're just going to write the Y there because they're just used to doing that. You know, and that got me to thinking, well, maybe we need to drop the W and just become GNA. And so we ordered new jingles that dropped the W, and it was, you know, for a while we were, you know, GNA. It's a great story. Yeah, yeah. And it was because, again, we were doing everything we could to make sure we were differentiated from other call letters, especially because it was a diary system at the time where you wrote down, you know, what you listened to and for how long and, and all that stuff. GNA, all kinds of country, 24 hours a day, in stereo. Listen, it sounded good to me in the shower this morning, but then again, I'm not awake yet. 24 and a half before 7 o'clock with Gordon Lightfoot from 75. Really good people. 1077 FM Country G and a Gordon Lightfoot and rainy day people. 21 and a half now before 7 o'clock with Chris. Tuesday morning, the 11th of September is here, and the station committed to the local country artist is doing it again. And with the help of the local country artists this year, we're going to do it even bigger and better than ever. What it is is the second annual WGNA Radiothon for the Statewide Country Music Association, which of course is based in Cortland, New York. And if you're a local country music act, give me a call after 9 this morning to volunteer your time at 518 Eight two eight three forty nine hundred. We'll get it together and make some money for these guys from the station committed to the local country artist GNA. There's only one. Now, did it make a big difference? Again, I never did the research afterwards to find out. I can tell you that by the early '80s, we were a top five station. Yeah, you know, we we did you know break the top five while I was there, and then many years later, and not many years, a few years after I left there, they became number one and stayed there forever and ever. So obviously, there's an audience, you know, for that music here in the Northeast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's a great story, though. The thought behind Thanks. that and and how that very likely did make a difference. It, it could have turned a corner for us. It, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, this wasn't a time where you had the benefit of some of the market research that you would have now. True. You had to have your finger on the pulse. It's true. To think yeah. about it like that. Yeah. So. The other thing about, and, and, and this is where it's missing today, 
when you were live and you were in the studio, you were taking phone calls from people. Now, some of those phone calls sometimes didn't get to you. They stayed at the front desk or whatever. But a lot of times we had a, a, a phone number right into the studio. It was the contest line. And you'd put people live on the air sometimes for these contests. So those people are your lifeline. They're the ones that are telling you, you know, and, and calling you and saying, I want to hear that song again. You know, if somebody had called me and if I, if I had thought fast enough, I would have said to Don DeRosa, but I had 10 phone calls for that song. I had to play it again. You know, I didn't think to tell him that. And I didn't. I like the song myself. But but that's part of what happens when people are telling you what they want to hear or they're commenting on what you just said or did. You get a feeling for the audience and you use that as, you know, your research sometimes. Yeah. And you just mentioned remotes, too, which is another place where we all got a lot of face-to-face -face time with, with some of our listeners. Mm. I wanted to ask you, and it can be remotes or it can be something else too, promotions. What mm. are some of your favorite mm. memories about participating in promotions or some fantastic things <laughs> or some that didn't? I mean, oh, so anybody, I think anybody 50 or over, right, in this mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. we could all tell the line from WKRP as God is my witness. <laughs> I thought turkeys could fly. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so, yes, tell me a, a, a good promotion, a promotion that didn't go well. Well, anything. I can't think of anywhere animals were harmed in the making of the promotion, you know, like WKRP, but that is, that's just a classic right there. And it tells you what you would do, the lengths you would go to to try to find an audience. You know, I remember growing up, Boy, somebody's going to have to help me with this one when they listen to this and get back to me on this. I want to say either TRY or PTR did a purple pillbox contest. I want to say they hid things inside of uh, little purple containers and spread them out all, all over the, the region for people to, to find them. And they give you hints on the air. And somebody help me out with this one after, you know, after you listen to this and, and remind me, and we'll talk about it on Facebook. But there, I was, I was involved in, in quite a few fun ones. We, I, I suppose the, the biggest one that I was ever actually involved with was giving away a pickup truck, which back in the 1970s, early 80s, to be able to do that on your station was pretty cool. You got to remember, this is back when stations were owned by, you know, small businesses. You know, they were a small business. You couldn't, until the late 90s, own more than one AM, one FM, or one TV in the same market. So to be able to come up with the money or the promotional oomph to be able to do something like that. So when we, when I was told that was going to be our contest, I came up with I Love My Truck, which happened to be a song at that time by... Gosh, I don't know. Was it Glenn Campbell? I forget who did the song. But anyway, it was called I Love My Truck. So what we had people do was take a picture of their current truck and tell us about the truck. You know, how old is it? And how long have you had it? And how many miles does it have on it? And, you know, the whole thing. And we would read these descriptions on the air. And if you heard about, you heard, heard your truck and called in in time, you got into the drawing for the new pickup truck. And right now, going to give away one of our FM, so one of our 107 FM converters, actually, in the I Love My Truck contest. Give a, a chance at it, at least, to somebody. It's our 10th anniversary contest. And as you know, we're giving away a 1984 Dodge D100 swept lawn. Sw I do that every time. Swept lawn half-ton pickup truck from Village Dodge, Green Street in Hudson. Now, we're going to describe a pickup truck from one of the uh, almost 400 pictures we've had sent to us so far in our contest. And if that person is listening and recognizes their truck from the description we've uh, been sent by them, we have to hear from them within a half an hour at 518-283-4800 to win the converter and become eligible for that grand prize. They've already won a great GNA baseball cap. Those things are in great demand. And we had so much fun with that. We dragged that out for at least four to six weeks, probably during a rating period, because we're trying to get listeners that are filling out those diaries to be coming back again and again to the station. And we just had a ball with that. Now, the tricky part was when we went to give the truck away, it was going to be all these people. I forget how many we had. We had to have keys made. Only one would start the truck. And then the others, you'd put them in and then nothing would happen. Well, we could have, because they're at random, we could have given that truck away in the first hour of the four-hour broadcast or three-hour broadcast, whatever it was. 
Thank God it lasted until there were only about a dozen keys left. And so for this whole time, people are listening and they're lining up the dealership because, you know, they want to try their key and the whole thing. It was it was a kick. And the uh, I just recently uh, listened to an old promo that we did for the ad agencies locally. And it mentioned that they had to stop advertising with us because they couldn't get enough trucks into the dealership to deliver to people. So they actually weren't on the air for a while with us because the promotion had been so successful, they, they couldn't get the stock. That's you know, so I, I was going to ask you if you had to run spots for them for the following year. To well, pay well for the and truck, that's pretty but, much what we did. Yeah, maybe that's if how you we got sold it. enough trucks for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's how we did it. We we traded airtime for uh, you know for the the truck itself, yeah. and and it and it worked out well. And again, by that time we were again a top five station, so we had a real good base for listeners. And uh, we, I, I, that was that was one of the most fun ones. So, well, we had some other great great things. Fryhoffers did contests with us. Remember, first prize, you know, the meat company, you know, locally that used to have a plant in in Albany. That 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 worked out nicely because the name was first prize. So they had a jingle that said something like, "Congratulations, you've won first prize," and we would give away you know some of their product that way on the air. And so there, there were fun ones like that. You know? Were there any uh, travel or far away ones or any celebrity ones, anything like that that you think of, or even just fun times that you got to meet celebrities? Oh well. Yeah, we could There's do a, a whole podcast those. on right. that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had a ball uh, meeting, especially country music folks. The country music artists, and I think still to this day, they understand what side their bread is buttered on, and it's the, the side of the fan. And you've got to pay attention to the fan. I can't tell you how many different concerts we sponsored where these artists would stay after the show and sign autographs, many of them until the last person that wanted one got one. And so they'd, they'd be there for a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour after their show, just to make sure everybody that wanted an autograph, you know, got one. And, and that was, that's what I really loved about country music, which I had never been exposed to growing up, never really thought I'd like. And yet I wound up working, playing country music for about 12 of my 17 years on full-time radio. Yeah. Yeah, very generous. A lot of the uh, country artists, absolutely. Yep, yep, and and just and a lot of them just great down home people. My f- probably my favorite person of all time was Dolly Parton. She, yeah, she, Dolly. Yeah, I met Dolly and got to interview her. She performed at SPAC one year in the early eighties. And you remember uh, Paul Cassidy from uh, local uh, radio, Eric Schwartz was his real name, and he's, he's gone now. We lost him may, way too soon. But Paul and I were both there to interview Dolly after her show. This was at SPAC, and the, uh, there was going to be a reception by RCA Records, or label, at the Hall of Springs, right next door, after the show. So he and I arrived at the same time. I'd never met him before, but I was a fan. I listened to him on the radio. And we had our wives with us. And he said, I'll make you a deal. He said, when I'm sitting talking with her, please take some pictures of of me talking to her. And when you do it, we'll do the same. And so that's what we did. And Dolly gave us each about 15 minutes or so, and we we interviewed her. And so I've got pictures of, I don't know if I have any of Paul, but I have a couple of his wife sitting next to, uh, to Dolly and mine as well sitting there and interviewing her. But she was once again the epitome of, of uh, country music class. We'd be interviewing her, both Paul and I, and somebody would walk by behind us doing this interview because we were kind of out in the open, and they're heading for the reception, and they'd say, oh, Dolly, great show, and she'd interrupt the podcast, the podcast, listen to me, interrupt the interview, and turn around and say, oh, darling, thank you very much. I had a great time out there, and you know that sort of thing. So the interview was interspersed with you know some uh, thank yous to the listeners as they went by, but, but we, we that, that's, and, and she is one of the most, has some of the most beautiful skin that you've ever seen in your life. At least I would hope it's still happening, but back <laughs> back in the early 80s when she was a little younger, just peaches and cream, exactly, complexion. And I was just taken aback by her her beauty, both inner and outer. It was uh, She was something. Well, I am jelly. <laughs> <laughs> jelly about that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great one. Well, I know that Maybe you don't want to go on forever, but I do want to ask you a little bit about some of the other side gigs and and things. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about then some of the other directions that you took. Well, yeah. I mean, after full-time radio, obviously, I had to do something to make a living. After 12 years with WGNA, I was on, on... 
unceremoniously fired, which happens in the business. I found there was no good reason for it that I knew of at the time, but I found out later the station was going to go up for sale. And I was the third highest paid guy on the staff after the general manager and the sales manager. Yeah. And so get rid of me and you can pay for a couple other people, you know, you know, that would make half of what I made, you know. So bottom line is in my early 86, I'm out of full-time radio. So I went to work, <laughs> the, the, you know, crazy story. I'm looking for work in early January of 1986, and I'm telling my godfather about the fact that I've been let go and I'm looking for work. He said to me, something he had learned is let everybody you know be your eyes and ears. You need to be in touch with everybody in your Rolodex to tell them what you're looking for or that you're just looking. And, and that's what I did. I really wasn't sure I wanted to stay in radio full time at that, by that point. After 17 years in radio, I was making a grand total of $17,000 a year, which kept a roof over our heads, but just barely. Okay, I did have to have part-time work. I'd worked at the New School of Contemporary Radio from 1978 until about 1982, about four or five years, I think. And so I thank God because that, that helped you know put food on the table. And so... My, my wife, Marie, does not remember this, but she said to me, maybe radio isn't the end-all and be-all that you want it to be. Maybe there's something else out there for you. She tells me she still does not to this day remember saying that to me, but I remember her doing it and thinking, okay, well, let's look outside. Well, I get a call from a friend of mine that I had done. I've been done doing some volunteer work for a number of years at WMHT, the uh, public TV station here locally, Channel 17 at the time. And one of the women that I worked with, her name was Denise McCoy, and her husband was one of the managers, well, I'm sorry, one of the partners in a CPA firm. And so when I told her that I was looking, she goes, you know, my husband's CPA firm might be able to use somebody like you. And I said, what, do you want me to play records at lunch? I mean, what do you, <laughs> CPAs? What, what the heck? And she said, no, no, they're looking for their first marketing director. And I swear to you, I said, what's marketing? And this is, again, 1986. And she said, well, up until recently, you could not advertise CPAs, lawyers, doctors. They could not advertise. This, was, uh, this changed in the early 80s. So by 86, some of these professional services firms were now looking for people to help promote their business through marketing. She says, marketing is what you do off the radio to market your radio station. So that's your billboard, that's your yellow pages ad and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Well, I know what marketing is and I just didn't know that's what it was called. So it took a couple of weeks where every time the phone rang, you know, my heart would, but I, I wound up becoming the first marketing director at a company called Marvin and Company, CPA firm that's still around here in, in the Northeast. They were in Schenectady at the time in J Street in Schenectady. Quick funny story to the, the job interview. I'm, I'm thinking, how am I going to mesh as a, as a former radio guy with a CPA? I mean, come on. You know, what do you think of when you think of a CPA? You know, this boring guy that sits there, or a woman, that sits there with numbers all day. You know, I mean, what kind of personality could they have, right? You know, and so I'm thinking this, 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 yeah, this is out there, but I'll go to lunch with this guy. He invited me to lunch. So we go to uh, the Mohawk Club, which at the time was just men, professional businessmen. Mm -hmm. And we go there and we're enjoying lunch. And when the lunch, and I'm, I'm really getting to like, like this guy. This He was the general manager, Nick Mastraccio is his name. I'm getting to like this guy really quick over lunch, especially because he bought me a fancy lunch. <laughs> and so we're getting along. His sense of humor was just as wacko as mine. All right. You know, and I really didn't think, again, that it, I thought CPA is such a serious business. But he had a great sense of humor and he's laughing at, uh, along with me, not at me. And we're having a great time. So as long Lunch is ending, I get this tap on my shoulder, and I turn around, and the guy looks at me and goes, yeah, I thought it was your voice. I saw you on WMHT last night, and I had been on the night before helping to sell something, you know, wow. membership campaign or something, and he recognized my voice and then my face when I turned around. So we get into the cloakroom to put our coats on, so January, and Nick looks at me and goes, okay, how much did you pay that guy to do that just now? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I really like this guy, you know? And two weeks later, I was working for them, and I stayed there for five years as their first marketing director. 
And during that time, started an organization that's still going today. It'll be almost going on 40 years old. Actually, it'll be 30, their 35th annual conference will be next uh, May. And they've invited me for a reunion of sorts with folks that helped start the organization. I helped start a group called the Association for Accounting Marketing. And what it is was marketing directors just from CPA firms all over the country and eventually the world. And so next year will be their 35th annual conference. So the organization is probably 36 or 37 years old. And you helped start it? I helped start it. Believe it or not, I'd only been working at uh, Marvin for about two years. And I had gone to a couple of inter- uh, uh, conferences, marketing conferences that the AI CPA put on, the American Institute of CPAs. And my boss, after the first one he went to me with, he said, uh, I expect you're going to be a speaker here next year. I, uh, I don't think so. You know, I mean, I've only been in the business for a few months, and he's expecting me to be a speaker the following year. Well, I was not. But at the end of that conference, a bunch of us, I got, like, a bunch of us got together as marketing directors. So, you know, we have to have our own association. And so about 10 of us got our companies that we worked for to back us financially that we would pay back with the first dues that we would have. And we actually wound up within a a couple of years with about five to 600 members. We were paying all our companies back. It happened very quickly. And so I was able to go back to him and say, well, you know what? I wasn't able to be a speaker this year, but I've started an association. And so (laughs) I wound up being president for a while of the board. And which is a volunteer position. And we put our conference on one year. I forget where it was. And there were a couple of guys there from a local printing and publishing company called Newkirk, Pete and Ray Newkirk. And and they saw me up in front of all these people at these conferences kind of kind of running it. They they made me the MC. I don't know why. Hmm, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm telling people, you know, the next session is going to be here and uh, they were, and they we're all meeting downtown, you know, for dinner tonight and stuff like that. And they saw me kind of organizing this thing and they offered me a job and I wound up working for the New Kirks for 12 years after that, selling their marketing materials that they sold to market to uh, CPA firms around the country. Yeah. So, amazing. yeah, so it led to a whole new career. I'm in the Hall of Fame. That's the Hall of Fame oh. uh, over there, the AIM Hall of Fame. I was uh, named into that. I was their volunteer of the year a couple different years. As I say, I was president of the, the group for a while and had a whole new career. There's also a couple of books over here from the American Institute of CPAs that I wrote chapters in. So I became an author, which I never expected to do in my life. And it was a whole new thing. And at the same time, I'm making sure I'm home on Saturday mornings to work at WTRY. All that time. Yeah, all that time. And I was doing part-time radio, but full-time in professional services marketing. Very briefly to round it all out, and then we'll we'll get back to some more radio stuff. After that, I uh, went to WMHT as an actual, uh, I'd been volunteering there for like 30 years. I was on their board for a while, and I went back to them full-time as an employee running the annual, we actually had three annual auctions, WMHT. I was the auction manager for about four years, and then following that, I managed to work as an instructor at a uh, voice acting company, teaching folks how to voice. Voice, be voice actors. And you've been a great mentor to a lot of well, people. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed that. We, we upwards of a couple of thousand people a year, we, uh, we educated and trained uh, to be voice actors. Yeah. So I was training my competition because I still do voice acting to this day. <laughs> Yeah. Well, are they competition? I don't know if they are really, Chris. I don't know about that. Now, I don't mean to direct this this piece because you're the interviewer, but I, I just there's one more thing I want to mention, and it's something that actually we talked briefly about when I interviewed you a few months ago, and that is volunteer work that I did over the years. I when I was at WGNA, the last three or four years I was there. The local chapter of the National Kidney Foundation approached us about doing a fundraiser on the, on the weekends, of a radiothon. And so I did that for them for about four years at GNA. And when I was let go, actually took it over to another radio station to, to help them out. I want to say it was WPTR. They were doing country music at the time. And then eventually, I think we did one on WTRY, which was fun. And so I wound up being offered a, a spot on their board. 
And within a few years, within about three or four years, I became president of the local chapter. And at the same time, started going to national meetings and wound up on the national board of the National Kidney Foundation. And I just had such, you, you know, where the, you, you talk about how much you get out of volunteering. It is so true. I got so much more back yeah. for giving a few hours of my time, you know, a week to this organization. And I was on the national board for about 10 years. And loved every second of it. I have friends in every city in America. You can, and I keep in touch with uh, many of them still. And that led to my work at WMHT, uh, MHT's board, and then working for the studio, uh, working for the uh, at the TV, and a little bit on the FM, helping them raise money, raise membership dollars. I wind up being asked by the general manager of the station at the time to get involved in other charities in the area. Just because you're working for a not-for-profit doesn't mean you can't help out other not-for-profits. And so I wound up, this is how we cross paths, at the, in effect, I'm wearing the T-shirt today, the Alzheimer's Association, because my friend Mark Kaplan was the education guy there and the, and the PR guy, if you will, on the local chapter. Now, I meant to ask you, and I don't think we got into it when we talked, what was your uh, connection to there? Did you have somebody Hardly in the Mark. family? Well, right. A couple of things. So Mark and I had worked together in a couple of places. Mark Kaplan, mm. fabulous guy. Mm. And we miss him, of course. Uh, every day. But so that was part of it. Somehow or other, I I heard about it from him. But yes, unfortunately, in my family, we'd had a couple of people mm. who, who had that disease. Mm. And it was a rough time, but it was very meaningful and good to be working with other people who had similar experiences. And, you know, we did a little, we went down to lobby day one day, I remember, out of the Capitol. Yep. We did a few different things with yeah. that. So, yeah. No, yeah. they were a great organization to work for. And I, I, I went up the ladder there as well, but I uh, wound up leaving MHT. When I wound up leaving there, I knew I wasn't going to have the, the time to give the organization. So I was on the board for three or four years and then stepped aside. But the, the volunteering, I remember a quote that I've used many times from uh, Winston Churchill, and it's so true. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And I've always lived by those words and since the time I started volunteering at the at the uh, Kidney Foundation. Yeah. And they also got me into being a blood donor. I, I've donated gallons of blood over the last 40 plus years to the Red Cross because of, you know, that. Giving so, a gift of life. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's something, too, you never regret that no. time. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Still, we were on uh, Cape Cod where most of my family lives just a few weeks back and had uh, lunch with an old friend of mine who got, kind of got me into the Kidney Foundation and he became the chairman of the board for a while of the Kidney Foundation. And he and his wife now live part of the year on Cape Cod. So we had lunch with them and it, it was like it was yesterday. We just caught up and neither one of, one of us are involved anymore, but we still keep in touch with some of the friends we had over the years there. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can think of a couple of other goofy radio questions. Oh, please. I, I, I mean, I could skip them and, and just go on. You let me know for time. I, I, th I think we're good on time. I'm, okay. I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to put this together. Of course, as you're listening to this, you'll find out what I decided. I don't know if I'm going to drop in some uh, bits and pieces of air checks from the stations that I worked in, which yeah. I always include at the end of, you know, my own at the end of a podcast, but I'm probably not going to do a, a whole big thing at the end of it this time. So it'll probably be interspersed on some of the call letters you've heard me mention. Yeah. All right. Well, I asked about promotions. I wanted to find out about fun promotions. Hmm. Here's a little sideline. Police involvement. Were there ever times? <laughs> because you your career spanned a lot of different decades. That's true. And let's just say some of those were pretty heady days in radio. Mm -hmm. So were there ever times that you can recall that there was police involvement, either promotionally or at an event or yeah, involving yeah. a big ego, anything like that? Yeah, yeah. N n not any really funny stories, but this ties right into the uh, giving that we've been talking about. I once got arrested on the air. <gasps> yeah. Okay. That's a good story. Yeah. I got arrested because I was polluting the air. <laughs> as a disc jockey. <laughs> and, Set that up. Yeah, that was a, a fundraiser in Tupelo, Mississippi, where I worked for uh, 11 months 
seemed like 10 years, but it was only 11 <laughs> months. And that was the time I left GNA before I came back to the GNA. I left as the news director, came back, and became a disc jockey on GNA. Those 11 months in between, I worked for my old college buddy I was talking about, Doug Nitrara's his name. He went by Jay Douglas on the air, thank goodness. And he uh, was the program director that brought me down there. And he comes up with this great idea. We're going to raise money for a, a, a blind girl that's going to the Pan Am Games, okay, for the uh, disabled. Donnie and Marie Osmond on your favorite radio station, WJLJ, 316 in the afternoon. 92 degrees on the outside. It is a little warm. We've got some good country until about 4 today. And we trust you'll stick around for it Un until then. Lee County Sheriff Robert Hearns. Chris Warren here. Uh, I, I'm Chris Warren, yes. Chris, I have a warrant for you for polluting the air. Polluting the air? Would you let me put these handcuffs on you, please? Uh, <laughs> uh is this, this has got to be a joke. Um, this is no joke. He's, uh, can I, can I see the, do you have a warrant actually with you? I'd like to have the warrant right here. <clears throat> uh, that's uh, what it says. That's, that's my name. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm in trouble, folks. Uh, l listen to this and I'll be back in a couple of seconds. Well, that is exactly what happened just a, a couple of moments ago on uh, WJLJ. In fact, uh, Chris Warren is down at the at the jail right now. Chris, are, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here, Jay, in, in one piece, and and I, they just cleared up the whole mystery about what it's about, and I feel a little bit more at ease now. But they are going to keep me here in in jail for a while, and, and I'll tell you what the deal is. What is the deal? Uh, they tell me that if we can uh, raise the money for uh, Linda Shell to go to the uh, the special Pan Am games for the deaf that we'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to get out of jail, which, which would be nice because, uh, you know, it's kind of hard, uh, doing a show from, from down here. So, uh, what we're prepared to do is right now ask, uh, people to, to call in to the station, call into WJLG and pledge any amount they can, they feel they can afford at this time that they can send in to the station. And give us a call, and once we get up to about $400, they'll consider letting me out. Of course, Linda needs 800 so uh, let, let's hope they stick by that, that 400 story they told me. I'm, I'm kind of skeptic there, but... Are you are you really in the jail? Uh, well, I'm on my one phone call. I'm up in the phone. This is your, your, your only phone call you have to make to the radio. Not to your mother or to your wife or someone, but to the radio station. Well, I, I thought I'd better let you know where I am, or you might think that I just took off on a little vacation. That was a kick. And I actually didn't spend the night in jail. We didn't hit our goal until early the next morning. So I went home and then went back to the jail the next morning and finished the remote. But I was broadcasting from a jail cell to the point where the guy in the cell next to me that I couldn't see through the bars hands me a $5 bill. He actually donated to the cause listening to me talking on the radio in the cell next to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was wild. That's but, a great promotion. Yeah, it, too. It, I mean, it, yeah, what yeah. What a great story that is. Yeah, it, it was fun. And I was on the front page of the Tupelo newspaper. Had to be the Tupelo Times, right? I don't remember the name of the newspaper. I've, I've got it in my scrapbook somewhere. So I, but I was in, on the cover the next day of uh, being arrested behind the microphone. And then they show me in handcuffs being put put into the police car and the sheriff's car it was it I was love cool. that. I love it, that. it was fun it was it was a lot of fun and and I've always blamed my buddy Doug for my you know day in jail <laughs> any others any oh geez it, it's tough we did so many things over the years nothing else involving police well I, I will say this we back in the early 80s there was a local group out of Voorheesville called Southbound I remember and them. do you remember them they made a big splash locally and a little bit nationally, I'm happy to say, and we promoted them from very early on in their careers. I even did an hour-long interview with the five guys that were in the in the group. Doug Flint was uh, one. Yes, yes. Well, How did you know Doug Flint? Well, I, I was a graduate around that time, ah. or, or just maybe, yeah, right around then. Okay, somewhere. okay, yeah, yeah, right, but you, you're from Voiceville, of course, remember, that's where you grew up. I can't up. remember the other name uh, Dave, Dave Burnham was right. the lead, uh, was, lead singer. Who was a teacher. He was a teacher, exactly, yeah, yeah. Who saw that coming? Uh, I don't know. No, no, I've got a picture of Dave in the next room, in my bedroom, our bedroom here, because one of their concerts at the Empire State Plaza, my boys, who were probably 
probably, what, three and five at the time, got up on stage and sang the song, one of their songs with them, yeah, because they were exposed to so much. You know, we played them in the house all the time, and I think I had a cassette of their stuff I'd play in the car. So they they knew the songs, and Dave invited them up on stage in front of 6,000 people and to sing a song with them. Anyway, at one point, we were doing an annual concert in Voorheesville. In is there a little park behind the the, the town hall or near, near the, the village hall? Yeah, right. Yeah, yes. And th- we did it one year, and there were so many people that came that the police department could not handle the crowd. And when we went to plan it for the next year, they said, "Sorry, we we can't do it because we know they're getting so popular, the, the town will have to shut down. We just, you know, we're going to have a major problem." And so that's the only trouble you know that I <laughs> ever had with the cops when they told me you can't come here no more. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? But we had a lot of fun with them. I can, and you won't be able to think of them all, but I can just imagine all of the different places that you went to for promotions. There must have been, of course, parades. There were. Mm-hmm. There were county fairs. You yep. just mentioned so Empire State Plaza. Yeah. You've probably been at just about every performing center. Yeah, on the pretty stage much all the MC. venues. I was lucky enough to introduce folks on stage, like, you know, I mentioned Dolly. I don't know if I interviewed, I didn't introduce her at SPAC, but uh, Kenny Rogers, Ann Murray, Ronnie Millsap. Mel, um, 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 Mel Tillis, as they used to say. So quite a few that I introduced on stage, which was always fun to do. And of course, to interview them you know, before or after the show. We, uh, we went backstage. The Gatlin brothers were performing at SPAC. And we went backstage afterwards for the interview. And Marie is about probably seven months pregnant for uh, maybe our second Maybe it was our first one. Yeah, maybe it was Ryan, maybe the first one. Anyway, she walks in the room, and Larry Gatlin looks up immediately and points to her and says, I've never been in this town before. <laughs> you know? And I go, this is going to be a fun interview, you know, because – and he sat there eating popcorn the entire time I'm interviewing him. So he he just – you know, he was just having fun with us. But, yeah, so a, a lot of fun in, in those respects. The one at the Empire State Plaza with 6,000 folks – Southbound, and I believe they played before George Strait, somebody from RCA Records anyway. When that show was over, the folks at OGS, Office of General Services, called and said, you just had the biggest crowd the plaza's ever had. This was, again, the early 80s sometime. And they said, "Uh, we'd like to thank you. Can we put your call letters up on the tower, Corning Tower? And we said, wow, we would love that. Can we arrange that for a night where we have a concert nearby? We were going to do Conway Twitty at the Palace Theater. And so they said, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. We'll, and we'll put just GNA in the, in the Corning Tower on the top. Great. The boss decides we're going to hire a helicopter crew and a, and a film crew, and we're going to fly around the plaza taking shots of GNA lit up on the plaza. So that's cool. So that afternoon, they did that. And that evening, we come out from the concert at Palace, and we look up, and the fog is so low, you can't see the call letters at the top of the tower. The rain had come in and the fog, and we could not see the the, the tower. So we, we mentioned that to them, and within a few days, we said, by the way, and they said, fine, fine, we'll do it again for you. Yeah, we'll you know, figure out a way to pay you back. So, so yeah, so we had a promo for quite a while on uh, on TV locally that you know showed the call letters at the That's top of the corner tower. That was neat, yeah. yeah, yeah. Fun yeah. stuff. I just remember listening to radio as a kid, and they were always doing crazy things like this to get you to tune in the station. You know, radio stations would take out a billboard saying, you know, John Doe is coming, and you had no idea what that meant. And it turns out it was going to be their next big morning man on their station, you know, but everybody in town will be talking about it. And, you know, who is this John Doe guy, and what's the, fa- the ad for, you know? And uh, there, there wouldn't be any logo on there. You had no idea what it was about. You get people talking about it, then you mention, oh, by the way, we're a radio station getting free publicity from you folks, you know, and that's, that's how it worked. Yeah. Well, John Kelly... Somebody, of course, many people will remember him, of course, and, mm-hmm. and think about him. He, his famous saying was, it's not the steak, it's the sizzle. There you go. That's it. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. It's what you do with it. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, you 
when I listen to your air checks, they're just fantastic. Oh, and I really, <laughs> I wish, as I listen to them, I wish I could just turn on my radio dial right now and hear that show yeah. all the time. Because, of course, radio has changed a lot. But we're, we're not going to go down that, that sad story. But it, it, it gets mentioned toward the end of a lot of these podcasts hey, these you, days. Yeah. Your artistry in that, obviously, you have great awareness of what it takes to do this job very well. And then through these interviews, you've talked to people who've had all these diverse experiences, but I think they also bring some similar things. So what do you think are the secrets of succeeding in this job? Or what are some of the attributes that the people who have been successful have? Mm, mm. People like yourself. Well, I, I guess, and, and I don't know where it came from, but I've, I've always had a little bit of a sense of humor. Okay, you, you, you've got to have, you, you got to have the attitude. Well, it's it's like this thing that I think I've mentioned before. Uh, where here it is, here is a quote that I have above my desk. It's uh, from uh, Brendan Gill, who lived from 1914 to 1997. Not a shred of evidence exists in favor of the idea that life is serious. <laughs> okay, and that's word. Those are another words I live by. Life is is not meant to be serious. Okay, you you got to take things in stride and stay as positive as you can. So I've always been kind of that kind of guy. In high school, where I weighed 110 pounds, dripping wet, you know, the bigger kids would pick on me. You know, up to a point, and I used humor to deflect that. Okay, I got them laughing, and all of a sudden they became friends because they knew. They, they weren't really bothering me. They were just giving me an excuse to think up something funny to say to them. And so that's kind of where that started. It was shortly thereafter that I got into actually, you know, on the radio. And I listened back to some of those air checks from the early days. And I, again, don't know where those lines came from, you know. You you play a song, and at the end of the song, all of a sudden in your head is how to how to back sell the song, you know, and, and it would happen. Not a lot of that just wasn't planned. It just happened. So you have to kind of have that innate sense of humor. It's nothing that I think you can just said, okay, I'm going to develop this. It kind of has to be there first. And then I guess the bottom line is you got to like people, you know, because that's, they're your bread and butter. They're the folks that are going out to buy, you know, that product that you just talked about on the radio and they're listening to you because they enjoy you. And so if that translates into them doing something you ask them to do, that's terrific. And that way the station's popular and, you know, making money and you're making money and it, it goes from there. And in a strange way, you're having a relationship with these people. Absolutely. Even yes. though you don't know them by name. It's true. It's true. And some you do know by name because they call you up when you were live on the air. Yeah. Back when you were in the studio, I had a, a couple that were shut-ins. They were people that could not go outside for one reason or another, many of them elderly. And they, they would tell me, no, you're, you're my company from 10 to 3 every day. I mean, I, I couldn't live without listening to you, you know, Monday through Friday, 10 to 3. And so you develop those kind of relationships and you hope that, you know, a few that don't call are, are listening as well. I guess that would be the, the two things. I mean, you can certainly train somebody how to run the control board and how to take the meter readings, which none of that stuff you have to do anymore because it's all computer run and all you do is mouse clicks and the computer reads reads the you know, readings for you so that you don't have to let the FCC know that your tower light's flashing at night and stuff like that. Things that the average person wouldn't think about, but they're very well, we important. We used to. Yeah, we used to have to. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's the bottom line. You know, if you if uh, people, you know, laugh at some of your patter, I mean, I'm not the funniest guy in my family. Uh, my brother, Craig, is a, such a quick wit and and so 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 much you know, faster than I. We we try to beat each other, other to the funny line, but he often beats me. Yeah. So yeah, and so that's that's kind of you know in our, you know, in our upbringing, I guess. Yeah. Well, your warmth and your humor and your obvious caring for people really does come through. Well, thank in, you. In everything you do, thank and, you. And you have a great voice too. Yeah, and which a hard is worker, all of those cracking things. today because I never talk this much. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I hope that this was an enjoyable experience for you. You've you've made it, I think, an enjoyable experience for so many other people. I I hope that yeah I was able to uh, turn that around and well, make thank sure you, you got. 
I, at this opportunity. I couldn't think of anybody better to, to do it. I thank you for volunteering to, to do it or even suggesting it to me and for being there when I changed our schedule to do this interview three, four times in the last couple of weeks due to unforeseen circumstances. So, no, I appreciate the uh, the offer, and I'm glad I was able to take you up on it. And, hey, it looks like I'll be able to walk out of the room, you know, on two feet. So I guess it was a success, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Well, I look forward to seeing you at the next at the next gathering that okay. I can make it to. Me too. Thanks a lot, Diane. Radio Split Ranch. Special thanks again to my guest host, Diane Donato, for making this conversation so easy. Early in our talk together, Diane hinted at something we broadcasters call the dream. And unfortunately, we forgot to go back to that subject. So let me briefly explain that it's been our experience that about nine out of every 10 professional broadcasters who spent any length of time on the air have a recurring anxiety dream about our time in the business. In these dreams, we're usually in a radio studio trying Trying to do a live show, but for reasons unexplained, we either can't find the next record to play or the newscast copy can't be found or, or something or other is preventing us from doing our job. And we often awaken in a cold sweat because being prepared on the air was a must and we just couldn't do it in these nightmarish dreams. On a more personal note, I'd like to dedicate this last podcast of 2024 to another friend and colleague we lost this month. This is happening way too often, for my liking. Our friend of more than 40 years, Jim Nichols, passed away suddenly on November 10th, 2024. Born uh, James Netzer, Jim and I had a great conversation about his love for the business on this very podcast just last March. Jim was also a founding member of the Rock Trivia Night that I've hosted in my home since about 1985. And as I told his family recently, his passing is a lousy way for me to have a shot at finally winning a game. He was the best. Next month, another chance to learn about the history of Capital Region Broadcasting from the professionals who lived it. I hope you'll join me again. And in the meantime, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. <laughs>